Well, the Fuse and Tonics Conference, it's always a great pleasure to be back here and, and to share with this group, which is, in my mind, a very special group. Syntonics is one of the very few light healing technique uh, that's been around for so long in, in, uh, in the world. I mean, it is the 82nd conference you're having this year. It, it's absolutely remarkable. And um, as Hans mentioned, I'm president of the International Light Association, which is a, a, an attempt for all the people working with light, the, the therapeutic applications of light around the world to connect and to share our energies. Because as we all know, it is not an easy task to make the, the world at wide aware of the potential, the healing potential of light. Uh, we have to fight against enormous vested interests. And um, so we have every interest in gathering together and joining energies. There are few groups uh, of people around the planet, few very interesting schools and, and uh, modalities of working with light. Syntonics is one of the most uh, interesting, but there are many others. And it, it's essential that everybody uh, working with this gets to know what else exists in the world and, again, uh, connect. I mean, it's so great here, the social interaction, to meet people. It's uh, so stimulating. And you can do the same on a worldwide um, basis uh, through this uh, association, which we've created now uh, 12 years ago. And uh, every year we have a conference. Uh, I'll mention that later on. So um, uh, today I want to talk with you about uh, my own particular way of working with light. Um, and over the years I've been trying to understand myself better. What is special, what is specific uh, about this, this, um, this light that I've been using, that we've kind of um, discovered in empirical ways. I've, I've always been trying to understand in a scientific way why does it do, do what it does. And today I'm going to explain to you one way of looking at it, one way of uh, um, uh, understanding uh, these, this, uh, how we can have these different classes of effects of light. And um, I'm going to talk about what I call domains of influence of light. And the, one of the first um, most important, of course, is the objective domain. And by that I mean all the natural um, objective ways that light works on um, both on our body, on our brain, on our, uh, on our system. So I'm going to enumerate a few of the most uh, clear examples of objective ways uh, that light interacts with us. One of the most basic is photobiomodulation, um, where light um, through the cell mitochondria uh, stimulates ATP uh, production and re-energizes cells and the ADN and so on. So it's one of the very real um, objective ways that light works on us um, continuously. And it, it, it's many of these um, um, vectors of action have, have actually only been discovered uh, recently. Like photobiomodulation was discovered by uh, Tina Karu in the 90s. These are all uh, recently recent um, realizations. And of course, the, the, the one field that's very much in, in fashion today uh, there's a tremendous amount of research going on, uh, which is the whole um, action of light on the uh, retinohypothalamic uh, tract, the non-visual optical system, and how light interacts with our endocrine uh, system, the, the glands, and so on. So you, of course, as a group, know a lot about this. I won't go uh, in too much into that. And how light acts on our circadian rhythms. Um, again, very objective, real effects. Um, another class of effects are the um, photic driving, how light pulses interact with uh, the brain, the whole um, audiovisual entrainment um, way, modality of working with light. Again, very objective. When you're exposed to light pulses, it will have a clear effect on your brain. There's no... Um, Um, and then I come to the next domain, which is another class of uh, interaction with light entirely, which I call the cognitive domain. And this has more to do with the, um, the way we perceive light and transform it in, through our mind, through our brain, through the, the frontal cortex, into a, um, something that interacts with our mind. 
and light acts very powerfully at that level also. Of course, the main pathway is the visual pathway, light coming into the visual cortex and then spreading from there to the rest of the brain. And through that, we create our own vision of the world. We, we uh, recreate inside our brain our perception of the world. And then light uh, starts to be uh, um, a way for us to understand the meaning of the, of the world, uh, just through colors in paintings, and of course, through the whole uh, uh, film, TVs, it's all light coming into our eyes. These are all ways of light acting on our mind. And it goes even in, the, in, deeper, in deeper domains, in the spiritual dimension, with uh, using light and colors for mandalas and so on, using sacred geometry. Again, all ways into which light works on this cognitive um, domain. <coughs> so we have kind of these two uh, very different realities, the objective, physical, chemical reality of light acting on, on us, and then this cognitive domain, the, the, the way the brain, our mind, uh, our spirit uh, connects with light. And um, so my own particular field uh, of light work lies pretty much exactly in between those two domains. And that's why I've, I've, I like to call it now with this, uh, with this term, subjective domain. Because in this area, which is kind of the, the merging of the objective effects of light and the more uh, cognitive effects of light, you have a very interesting crossover uh, where you use light, the objective effects of light, but you use it to enhance or to induce higher cognitive perceptions. And when you start to work in that field, of course, you connect to everything that's connected with mind, uh, emotions, um, inner integration, and, and the whole uh, uh, physical uh, and, and mind healing aspects. So you have this field where, where light is used um, at the border between these two domains. And you could ask, uh, so how do we manage to use light at this particular uh, domain? Um, when you play at that level, you start to influence emotions, and you do that by focusing on uh, kind of the magic of light. We all know that light has this magical beauty that we are all sensitive to. Everybody's sensitive to the, the beauty of a rainbow. There's no uh, living uh, human being on the planet that is not affected by that pure beauty. It's all, it's wired in our brain to, to uh, perceive and to be uh, fascinated by these pure colors. So when you start to work in light, uh, with light at that level, you start to interact with that, uh, um, uh, acting deeply on, on emotions. Also, uh, when you use light in this uh, field, you can use movements of light and create a sensation of flow, unity, integration. You create, uh, we, we, in the way I work, we create a special room, a special uh, s a secure uh, s uh, room, a kind of a womb or a cocoon. Um, and so the environment starts to be in, uh, important. So it's a whole um, combination of elements that enable you to work with light in that particular domain. And um, so why would that be of a special importance? Uh, why would light um, working at that level uh, be potentially so powerful. So one way to look at it um, is through brain uh, uh, neurochemistry. And that we came across a few years ago through a colleague of ours who, who was a specialist in neurochemistry. And she saw the light that we were working with and she realized that it had direct effect on neurotransmitters. And um, so what we, we've been realizing is that the uh, positive sensory experiences um, create these sensations of pleasure inside our brain. When we see something beautiful, a so pure light, it creates a positive, pleasant space in us, in our brain. And that, of course, is a translation of specific neurotransmitters being secreted by the brain, if you want to look at it from this perspective. It's all the, the uh, catecholamine class uh, neurotransmitters uh, which are linked to pleasure such as noradrenaline, dopamine and the endorphins as well. All these components of pleasure and well-being in our brain can be directly interacted with through uh, pure light and colors. 
And um, it's well known that many of the psychological uh, problems, uh, whether it's depression, burnout, or whatever, are linked to in unbalances in these um, uh, catecholamine um, uh, class uh, neurotransmitters. People, because of various reasons, shock or, or uh, long-term uh, uh, depression or whatever, the brain stops being able to secrete um, proper amounts of these pleasure-related uh, neurotransmitters, and then you fall into this dark space out of which it's nearly impossible to, to escape because it's the, the, your brain simply does not produce the, the, um, the correct neurotransmitters. So light becomes one channel, a very natural channel, through which you can re-energize, restart the engine in some way. So it's all linked to using light to create this space of, of beauty, pleasure, and um, uh, security and so on, a positive sensory experience. So you can see that it's, for example, with syntonics, you also work with the beauty of colors, but you work in a very uh, clinical way. You have a color, one specific color for a certain amount of time. And of course, it will have a, a very positive effect. We, we all know about it. So what I'm describing here is, is a kind of different slant on it. It's uh, using light um, in, in a, a more organic way to more, uh, you, we're not trying to do specific effects, um, whether it's chemical or otherwise, which we're, we're trying to create this special space, healing space through the colors. And um, so as, as I was saying here, light in the subjective domain is ideally suited, suited to create uh, these pleasurable sensory, uh, sensory experiences. And then it, it is a powerful means to act on, on, uh, in psychotherapy and psychosomatic terms. And um, so we've seen, of course, over the years, many potential clinical application areas for this type of, of light. There's a list here of different things that can respond well to this approach. So what is needed to uh, create light uh, that will work at that level? Um, the what, what I'm working with is what I call light modulation, which is superimposing on light low frequency pulsations. So in itself, this is not so new. The, the um, um, brainwave entrainment pulsations have been around for a long time, since the 70s. The, uh, what is um, particular about what I'm doing is that I kind of uh, brought it to a more sophisticated level instead of just pulsing light like a stroboscope, which is usually done, I've created architectures of low frequency oscillators that are in interacting with each other, modulating each other. And this enables the creation of much more complex modulation patterns. And this is what is needed to create these light flowing light patterns that will start to be perceived at some, as something especially harmonious, beautiful, and, and, and uh, hopefully pleasure inducing. So through these modulations, um, I work through a uh, um, specific frequ frequency range. <coughs> it's uh, illustrated here. Uh, of course, the, the upper limit is pretty much the flicker fusion frequency, because beyond about 50 hertz, um, the visual system stops perceiving pulsation. You only see light, uh, uniform light. The, the retina isn't uh, fast enough to react much faster than that. And um, so, and I go all the way down to very low frequencies, about one hundredth of a hertz, which is a cycles taking about a minute to complete. So very, very slow cycles. So in that range, you interact with a number of, of uh, biorhythms. Of course, the uh, the brain waves are one of the main ones. Um, you can, of course, work with higher frequencies of light. Uh, Ed can tell you about that. Ed Condrat is a specialist in frequency-specific therapy. And then, of course, you're not trying to work with the visual system. You're working more purely with the, the vibrational information embedded in the light. But what I'm um, focusing on here is more visual effects. Uh, so it is limited to that range. And then uh, there's a number of other interesting frequencies, um, psychophysiological frequencies that you can interact with in, uh, within this range. Um, the heartbeat, the breath, um, 
peristaltic uh, rhythms, all kinds of rhythms within your body and, and uh, your um, system that have these low frequencies and th that are also subject uh, to resonance. Uh, just as brain waves uh, are subject to resonance, when you're exposed to a light pulse, which is in the same frequency range as your brain waves, the brain has a natural tendency to fall in sync and start to generate brain waves at that same rhythm. That, that's the whole phenomenon of entrainment through resonance. And of course, it's a universal phenomenon. Everything in our reali reality works through resonance, whether it's chemical reaction from light or, or a mechanical transmission of resonance. Resonance is a universal phenomenon that's fundamental to all interactions. And um, so within this range, with this light, you can interact with these lower rhythms within uh, the body. Um, so the brain waves, of course, is one of the most interesting and direct ones. I won't spend too much time on that. You're probably familiar with it. Um, again, <clears throat> in order to create these um, subjective domain light patterns, I found it's uh, useful to be able to work with uh, more than one light source so that I can start to work with uh, um, patterns which, for example, can be different on the left and right side of the, f of the visual field. And then you can start to work with brain laterality, which is a whole uh, um, fascinating area. Because, of course, we have a left and right brain, which, uh, which have different functions. And through the visual field, you can differentially uh, interact with each of the two hemispheres. So you can start to use light specifically in different ways for each hemisphere. It's a very interesting uh, uh, area of work. Um, so this is an example of um, the Sensora uh, projection system, which, which uh, I use. You have the person lying underneath here. It's a large screen. So the person is immersed into this field of uh, pure colors. And there's a number of different uh, independently controllable color sources, which uh, you see the projector has five, has five sources. So you can um, play with these more complex light patterns. It's a little short video uh, illustrating more in practice what the, what the setup looks like. So you have the, the chair, uh, the screen, you have the, uh, the special projector illuminating the screen. You have sound, it's, uh, it combines a specialized sound system, so it works all on or sound and light. And you also have a kinesthetic aspect through a special chair which has an array of sound transducers creating a physical vibration in the body. And we found it's quite important to have that physical anchoring in the system. Uh, it, it's an essential part of the process for us. And that's what it looks like when you uh, are in darkness. So the, the person is within this multisensorial field. All right, so, um, <clears throat> um, so this kind of light uh, in, in the subjective domain has uh, uh, listed here some of the effects that we see. Of course, deep, profound relaxation, you can imagine. Um, and within that space, free association of ideas, creativity coming up. One interesting aspect is that this, this space really um, d dilutes the border between conscious and unconscious. And people get into this very creative space where uh, the, the limit, the, the barrier between the two is, is thinner. So you have things emerging from uh, deep uh, buried memories. You have ideas coming up. So it's a very uh, rich um, uh, space. And um, it can uh, go towards meditation. It, uh, it, it, of course, you cannot create meditation through an external stimuli. It's purely an internal uh, phenomena of consciousness, of being aware, so no machine will do it for you. But this kind of space really um, makes it much easier to fall into that space. Um, <clears throat> now, one fundamental question in, in all this, which I, I've been really wondering in, in the last few years, <clears throat> working with this slide, are we working with the visual optic pathway or are we working with a non-visual optic pathway? These are two very different uh, ways into which light gets into our brain. 
Um, <clears throat> so, because if you look into the, the properties of uh, this light, it kind of could act on both. Of course, uh, you all know about the non-visual optic pathway. We have pioneers in this room of, uh, of uh, people who introduced the whole subject, whether it's Jacob Lieberman or... Uh, so I won't spend much time on this. You're familiar with it. So <clears throat> the deep effect on, on the neuroendocrine system. Um, but to work with non-visual um, non optic pathway, uh, usually, uh, you have a few conditions that are needed. Uh, first, it's quite slow. The, the response of the, the melanopsin, the pigment, um, uh, connected to this uh, non-visual optic pathway, is very slow. It takes about a minute of illumination before it starts to react. <clears throat> so we're talking here about long-term light exposition. And um, it also requires quite high intensities. Uh, this whole system in the body is designed to be entrained by daylight. So, of course, it's designed to, to uh, work with high intensities of light. So, you need, uh, for here is an interesting graph showing what the intensities in lux uh, that are needed to start to um, um, here affect um, the melatonin suppression, which is one of the main components of the effect, uh, this uh, non visual effect uh, of light. And you see that you need about at least 100 lux for about an hour before you start to really affect the, the non-visual pathway. So you need fairly intense light for quite a while. And in fact, in, in, uh, here is also another table showing you the, the illuminance level necessary to um, here have a significant melatonin suppression. And it's interesting, actually, you see that, uh, well, daylight, you need 270 lux. Um, the, um, of course, the high, high temperature light, which has a lot of blue, acts much more strongly. Also, you don't need that much intensities. And blue LEDs are tremendously powerful to work on, on the non-visual pathway because they're right at the center of uh, sensitivity of uh, the, these um, IPGRCs, the, the, the light-sensitive uh, uh, cells. But still, these are fairly high level. And I, I would believe, for example, in syntonics, you're probably working with lower levels than these. So, um, and in sensora, in any case, we are working with lower, lower levels. The, the illumination for the person sitting in the chair and, and the system that I just saw is about 60 lux, if you measure. And the sessions are about 20 minutes long. So you wouldn't have that much action on the non-visual pathway through a system like this. So most likely it is mediated through the visual optic pathway. And this is uh, um, actually a little uh, troubling because if you look at all the research going on right now in the, the field of light, and there is a lot, since, especially since 2000, since um, the whole thing got really got a, bit, a big boost uh, from NASA in the late 90s because they started to invest a lot of money to explore the effects of light for the astronauts. Uh, they were looking for ways to heal the astronauts far from uh, the medical system available on Earth. And they realized that light had this potential, so they started to finance a lot of research and that kind of got the ball rolling in the late 90s and since 2000 the whole field uh, became much more popular and now you have literally thousands of articles coming out every year on purely medical clinical research on the effects of light uh, which is of course absolutely exciting for us uh, working in this field because it's it finally it's coming in the mainstream it's no more this esoteric hidden uh, science that we work with but if you look at the amount of research, most of it is focusing on the non-visual optic pathway. That's really the, the main uh, focus of the research going on now. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of articles on the effect on the circadian rhythm, SAD, and um, the light pollution, and so on. And it's all very much focusing on the non-visual uh, optic pathway. And there is not that much research on the effects of colors um, uh, chromotherapy on the visual optic pathway. And um, if a system like the one I'm working with probably works through that pathway. So there is really 
a lot of research still needed in, uh, to understand better the, the deep and powerful effects of colors. So there is a lot happening now, but there is still a lot that needs to be done. Um, here. So as I said, the, the um, oh yeah, another interesting thing that, of course, with syntonics you're very familiar with, is the autonomic nervous system. The influence of light on the ENS is fundamental in syntonics. It's really the, the, the basis of Spittler's work. And um, again, I've been wondering, is this effect on the autonomous nervous system mediated through the visual or non-visual system? And I don't know, actually, maybe you syntonics people already have an opinion or an answer on that. Maybe you've considered it. But there's, there's few elements here that uh, I was looking at. Uh, of course, the, uh, we know that the uh, autonomic nervous system is regulated by the uh, hypothalamus, uh, and there is a direct link between the hypothalamus and this non-optical uh, pathway. That's how li light acts directly on the hypothalamus through that pathway. So you would assume that the uh, effect on the ENS is mostly mod uh, mediated through the non-visual uh, pathway. And, but in fact, you also, we also know that um, uh, emotions have a great influence on the ANS. There's a whole research of, uh, on heart rate variability uh, that Larry, for example, is, is very familiar with that shows how emotions and cognitive uh, co um, uh, sensations affect the ANS. So it's not purely a matter of this non-visual pathway, there is obviously interaction between the two pathways on the ANS. And it goes even further than that because you can see that these two systems, uh, visual and non-visual, are, are very intimately linked, in fact. And of course, we should expect that. There's no reason that the brain would be separated in these two different compartments here, which each have their function. It's all completely integrated within the brain. And um, I was seeing an interesting uh, clinical research um, conducted here, yeah, I mentioned it, um, where they, they had light stimulation uh, designed to stimulate the hypothalamus, so through the non-visual uh, optic uh, link, and they find with, with, through uh, measurements, brain measurements, that actually, is, so you see the first image here, you get stimulation in the hypothalamus from this light source, and after a few minutes, it starts to spread throughout the brain, and after 20 minutes, it spread through all the the whole frontal cortex, the whole cognition aspect. So really, this slide that was designed to work on the non-visual uh, optic pathway after a while spreads everywhere. So there is an interaction between these two visual and non-visual system as we would naturally suspect. So the question is, not, is never uh, so simple, unfortunately. And again, what about syntonics? Is it, does syntonics work through the visual or the non-visual pathway? Uh, I, Again, I don't know if some of you have answers on that, but I think it's a fascinating uh, uh, area um, because, as I mentioned, of course, the, the, the famous balance board is fundamental to syntonics, this influence on the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And uh, uh, the assumption is that some colors will act clearly on one side and some on the other side. And uh, it's actually interesting to um, consider that more closely um, because we're finding, again, that it's not that simple uh, when you try to actually measure it. Uh, and it's not easy to measure impact on the autonomic nervous system. There's not that many ways to uh, uh, assess and measure effects on, on the ANS. One of the easy and accessible measure techniques is heart rate variability. And uh, it's well known that uh, <coughs> when you split the heart rate in frequency bins, um, you have this standardized way of measuring it, and there are associations between these frequency bins and specific parts of the ANS. Uh, so through that, by simply measuring the heart rate var variability, you have a way, an indirect way, to try to measure the effect on the ANS of, of whatever you're trying to assess. So uh, there, are, there have been tests with HRV, and for example, Larry uh, for in uh, 2003 published something in your own journal, an experiment he, he made um, using HRV to measure the effect on ANS of various types of syntonic light. And uh, what he found <laughs> is that 
there was not a clear-cut influence as you would expect red stimulates sympathetic uh, uh, blue stimulates parasympathetic it's not not unfortunately it doesn't work that directly and easily and um, so he concluded this that uh, the uh, it's important to have an individual assessment and, and that it, it's not such an automatic and direct thing as we might want to um, uh, to see and Francis McManaman also published in your, your journal in 2005 an article on um, the ANS of light frequencies she used a similar uh, measurement techniques GSR algorithm HRV and uh, she also came to the same conclusion that there was no clear-cut uh, relation there, there there were a variety of different effects and it was not that simple and that direct and easy um, <clears throat> and now I come to uh, one clinical study that uh, I did with a, a team with Mary Ross which uh, many of you know she's also uh, she's been to St. Onyx uh, for many years and um, through her expertise we put together a clinical research again to try to understand better this influence between light and the ANS and um, it's not easy to make clinical researches I don't know if few of you have tried uh, before it, it's really uh, it's a it's a pain <laughs> it takes a lot of money it takes a lot of dedication uh, the little study that we made here uh, we did it with everybody donated their time and everything and still it, it costs over fifty thousand dollars in spite of all these absolute cost reductions so that explains why there's not that many clinical research being conducted in these fields which are not impacted by a lot of money uh, drugs and, and uh, the, the whole industry um, which has the money to finance this, this type of thing uh, for light there is not that much of it available um, so in any case we, we managed to do to put together a study that was scientifically uh, valid you need a good number of subjects you need at least uh, 20 to 25 subjects per um, type of measurement that you're trying to do here we had four groups of people 117 people and we were exposing them to three types of light programs uh, using this light modulation technique programs that were designed to have either a relaxing effect an energizing effect or a balancing effect and we had a placebo group it's not simple uh, what what would you use as a placebo for light effects uh, we had to, to uh, reflect on that for quite a while some people would suggest okay well no light this is your placebo you compare no light with the light but actually what we're trying to, to determine is not just the effect of light it's the effect of colored light so our the placebo we ended up with was white light so a fourth group of people was exposed to white light in the same intensity levels as those specific color programs so it, this enabled us to differentiate between uh, the specific effects of colors not just of light because of course any type of light will have a powerful effect <clears throat> uh, we had uh, uh, physiological measures again through uh, simply uh, uh, easily accessible techniques which are not too expensive hard rhythm um, skin conductance GSR and of course heart rate variability and we also has, we had psychological measures through a number of standardized, uh, standardized psychological tests. And uh, so this is uh, some of what we found. Uh, here in those graphs, the, the black is the placebo, white light, and the three colored uh, lights are the three uh, chromotherapeutic programs, relaxing, energizing, and balancing. This, these are the effects on skin conductance and on heart rate. And uh, you, you can see that there is uh, uh, much more effect uh, for example on the heart rate here was slowing down much more significantly with these colored lights in the case of GSR it's interesting the the, um, the white light was here and the relaxing and balancing colors reduced uh, skin conductance as would be expected from deep relaxation whereas the energizing colors increased it which is again exactly what we were we would have hoped to see so we had a good validation here of the clearly differentiated effects of these colors uh, if you look at HRV again very different results between the white light and the colored light but not that much difference between the different colored programs in terms of HRV 
you, you don't see this clear difference between the uh, energizing colors and, and the relaxing colors. So this is quite intriguing. We have an effect on the autonomous nervous system, but it's not necessarily that the, uh, the, the red color will stimulate the uh, sympathetic and, and blue color will stimulate the parasympathetic. It doesn't work so directly. But at least we could establish clearly that there was uh, an, an effect from colored light as opposed to white light. And actually, through um, also through the um, well, here's another one. Oh yeah, the uh, the VLF component in HRV is one of the most interesting ones. It's the one that's monitored by HeartMath, uh, and they to them it's related to the uh, the famous uh, coherence um, uh, factor. Uh, it's really one that's related to the uh, deep um, uh, coherence and, and well-being in a way. So it, it's an important component. And again, here you see a uh, much more impact by the colored light uh, on this component here. <coughs> um, okay, yeah, so this, um, we were surprised why we couldn't see this clear differentiation in the ANS between the colored lights. And one aspect that came out, uh, this is an example of how in clinical studies you can start with. Um, uh, a theory or a premise, and then on the way you find that things are, don't work as you expected. We're, as you saw in the sensorites, one of the important aspects is that the person is lying down under the light. Because we want to create this very deep relaxation space, it works much better if the person is uh, in a reclining position. But it turns out that when you're in a, in a reclining position, the uh, heart rate variability measurements don't work so well anymore. The, 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 the relation between these resonances in the body that are related to the heartbeat uh, work in a different ways. And we found out afterwards, after we had done all our, our measurements, that when you are in this uh, supine position, reclining, um, the, you lose some of the link. So that might explain why we couldn't see these uh, such clear-cut uh, um, um, differences. Although I'm sure it's not the whole story, it's just one component in the, uh, in the effect. As you see here, the person was lying down. This is the actual experimental setup uh, in the Texas uh, University uh, clinical study. Um, we also had the psychological tests, which um, um, showed more clearly differentiated results. Uh, here is a, uh, this was a test that's measuring mood states, standardized, standardized test. And they have this index that they call the, um, uh, the total mood disturbance index, which kind of is a composite of how much you are disturbed. And as you can see, the, uh, there was not much impact at all by the white light. Nothing much happened. But the three-colored light uh, significantly reduced, so they created a much, more, uh, much less disturbed inner space. And again, very clear effects. Uh, here, more, much more differentiated effects from the different uh, colors through the psychological assessment. So anyway, this study uh, showed quite clearly that uh, the, uh, the colored light uh, through this technique had um, a clear effect on the ANS and through that on the, the inner well-being and reduced mood disturbance. And what was interesting again is that all colored effect achieved this deeper relaxation. Even the one that was supposed to be energizing actually brought people to this much deeper relaxation state. The difference was that people were more alert and wakeful with the energize, energizing programs. So you have this very interesting combination of deep relaxation and alertness, being awake. And actually, this particular state is, um, is what's called the peak performance. Th this is what uh, every trainer is looking for uh, in uh, athletes or, or people who have to perform at, at uh, top level. They have to have this combination of deep relaxation and maximum alertness and wakefulness. It's, it, this is uh, an ideal state. And it's actually, it's also the state of meditation if you, if you look into it. So, um, and this is exactly what, what we found here, that we had this dual effect at the same time, deep relaxation and enhanced uh, wakefulness. So um, this was a very uh, um, en encouraging result for us. And it's at least validated clinically in, in a scientifically uh, 
uh, published and peer-reviewed uh, journal now. So just to wrap up, what is needed to um, create light in this uh, domain of uh, influence? I'll just summarize a few of the uh, components that I found to be important uh, in this through the years. One is uh, a calibration of light pattern complexity. What I mean by that is that we need a balance between the objective domain, which is a single color, for example, syntonics, and the cognitive domain, which is a complex, I mean, the, the, the visual field, infinite number of colors and meaning and complexity. Uh, if we work somewhere in between here, for example, in the Sensora, we have uh, five spots, like five pixels. We are in that intermediate range where we have enough complexity to start making the light appealing, beautiful, fascinating, but not enough to start uh, putting content in the light. This doesn't mean anything. The brain doesn't have to try to understand the meaning of this pattern. It just accepts it as is and relaxes in it. If you have a complex pattern, the brain, the mind starts to analyze it. So what does it mean? What memories does it bring up and so on? So this kind of intermediate range here is, is an important aspect of this work with light, this uh, particular approach. Um, low energy brainwave entrainment, what I mean by that is that we work with light pulses, but we don't work with stroboscopic light pulses. The difference is uh, quite significant. Stroboscopic light pulses you have here is just an on and off strong light pulse. And of course, we know that that has a deep impact on the brain. It, it, uh, that's the whole phenomenon of uh, brainwave entrainment. In this technique, we modulate only a small portion of the intensity of light so that it doesn't have this objective effect of impacting the brain, forcing the brain into a certain direction. This is much more uh, an invitation. Uh, you're seducing the brain to go into this direction because you have this light that's kind of mysterious light that's scintillating. You feel there is something special in it. You can't quite, s it's at the limit of perception. And so you, you don't, of course, your brain does not, uh, doesn't have to protect itself against it as it has to protect against strong stroboscopic pulses. So this uh, enables to bring the vibrational information much more deeply in the brain. Uh, this is our own uh, um, feeling about this. A third aspect is um, working with brain laterality. And that, of course, is possible when you have a system which, which has more than uh, one light source. So you can, as I was mentioning, affect completely uh, separately each uh, brain hemisphere if you, have, if you project different things on each part of the field. And uh, there's a whole area of research on that. Uh, uh, there's a lot of clinical research, actually, on this type of lateral light. Very powerful uh, modality of working with light. Um, another aspect which we find important is multi-sensorial um, stimulation. So we work not only with light, but we integrate the sound and the kinesthetic aspect, the physical aspect, and we find that these three together uh, create these much more powerful um, therapeutic environments. <coughs> the, the, the sound massage aspect, uh, um, this, this uh, physical muscular uh, relaxation aspect, uh, you can interpret it as a way uh, to stop cortisol pr production because of the, the relaxing effect. And uh, so it, it's another of these neurotransmitter um, interaction. And um, another one I, I can mention is uh, sub-delta modulation, which simply means uh, low frequency modulation below one hertz. So you're not anymore working with brain waves, you're working with slower rhythms uh, in, in, uh, in the body. And it's been found that uh, these very slow rhythms, uh, for example, seem to act most deeply on pain relief. Uh, there were studies on uh, fibromyalgia and chronic pain where they found that th these very slow rhythms below one hertz seem to have the maximum effect on that. And that's also been our own experience, that these light patterns uh, do have a, a powerful effect on, on the chronic pain and fibromyalgia, these very uh, slow uh, frequencies. Um, oh yeah, I just wanted to mention the, the, the system that I showed you, the Sensora, is a professional installation. It's, it's uh, used by therapists. And uh, I've wanted in the last uh, few years to create a device that would be more uh, accessible to the public. 
So I've created this uh, light sphere here that uh, um, uses the same light modulation technology, but in, in a portable way. And uh, this is what it looks like. We have one here. So it creates um, this similar flow of light, and it, it's also got this very low-level modulation um, in it that um, acts in, uh, as I described here. Uh, hopefully, this will reach more people than, than we manage with the Sensora, which is a, a specialized instrument for therapists. And before um, we, uh, I leave you, I'd like to just, uh, I, I mentioned the International Light Association in the beginning, uh, so I'd really like to, um, that you consider uh, being part of that association and um, benefiting from the, the conferences that we organize every year. I mean, they're, they're, um, we have uh, a lot of the top people coming exactly like you have here in the field of light and, and uh, health. And it's, uh, it's like there's a lot of common between the two organizations. For example, some of the uh, early presidents of the organization were your very own uh, Larry Wallace and Francis McManaman. So um, Syntonics people were really instrumental in creating the, the whole association from the, uh, from the beginning. Our next conference is uh, in September in Israel. Uh, it, it's uh, hosted by U the University of Haifa. And um, so we have a little postcard that's floating around here. I invite you to pick it up and to uh, have a look at the program or check the, the website. It would be great to see some of you there and, and so that you can join with this uh, wider family of people working with light. Uh, for example, we published this year a case study report um, of um, more than 20 case studies uh, using a variety of light therapy modalities, including syntonics. Uh, and this, uh, this little uh, booklet, this report, is available free to ILA members. I also have a few copies of it here. Uh, for those that get the hard copy, I have to ask uh, $10. But um, if, if you're interested, uh, ask me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Not bad, just in time. Perfect. Any yeah. questions? Are there any questions? I had one. You mentioned the, the blue light was most effective on the non-informational visual pathway. Non-visual pathway, yes. Okay. And given the screen time and most LCDs have an excessive amount of blue light, mm -hmm. what is your conclusion of how that affects people? It's a major issue. For sure, the, uh, the, the the effect of screens. They are just. Uh, oh, this is yours. Yeah. The. Um the effect of LCD screens on the visual system is, is a, uh, it's a major uh, problem that, uh, I mean, a few people here know more about it than most, how it's related to macular degeneration and so on, this excess of blue. And uh, so there are a few ways that you can try to protect yourself from that. One is using yellow glasses uh, that filter out the blue, especially at night time where, where your eyes are more sensitive. You can use these glasses, which are uh, available from a number of sources that are made specifically for that. There's also a very simple, nice way. There's a little software utility that I, I found this year that um, just gradually blocks out the blue light from your screen, and it's linked to the, the daylight cycle. So it does it on its own. It works very nicely. It's called Flux, and you can download it. It's, it's free. And um, so that's one way to protect yourself against it. It's an app. Well, uh, it's, it's, an app it's for the PC, uh, I think. Uh, okay. They may make a Mac version, I don't know.